Hey Juan, how you doing? Hello, Professor. Okay, I'm doing fine. How about you? Yeah, okay, pretty good. Just want to double check any issues with the access keys and with the links that I share with you. Um, I'm still not sure how to access the labs. Like, I don't, I don't even know what website uh, I was supposed to go in. I think I got logged out of one of my accounts and I forgot how to log back in. Okay. I don't know if that was like, hey, yeah, yeah, I'll fix it today. Cause all right, I just want to double check that you had the access. Yeah, I mean, I have the I have the access keys for the first two. Uh. If, if the labs or something went through, then I'll be able to see it today. Otherwise, uh, everything okay. else is fine. All right, we'll take a look. Hello, Lamar. How are you doing today? Okay, how are you doing? Yeah, okay, pretty good. Way, I don't know if you uh, received the uh, email I sent you regarding getting into the uh, the test labs. Yes, I did. And Lamar, did you receive my reply by any chance? I no, I did not. Okay, yeah, just take a quick look. And that's something that we're going to double check today as well. Okay. But okay. yes, I, I receive it. Okay, thanks. Hello, Veda. How are you doing? I'm good. How are you today? Good, good, pretty good. Thank you for your email. I'm glad. So you just work all the time. Is that correct? Say, say that one more time. <laughs> you work all the time. I do. You I... have to work all the time. You have to emails all the time. Then you got this big project at work, and then all of us. So. <laughs> <laughs> you know, is it, something that is. I think it's on my DNA that I need to be you know keep myself busy all the time yeah, yeah. <laughs> i know that feeling well thank you family for it <laughs> uh, yes i actually uh they're very supportive which is a good, good. that's really good <laughs> yes okay. yeah let's wait uh, a few more minutes uh i know that it's 5 56 and i just want to wait for the rest of the class to join okay. to mute myself.
Hey, David, how are you doing today? Hi, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Okay, good. That's good. Happy Monday. Happy, mo happy Monday. Thank you. Hello, you well. Good day. Good, good. Happy minute. Monday. And I'll take my thing off. There I am. There you are. Okay. <laughs> I am having an issue and it's not letting me in. I can see you. I can hear you. Oh, can you hear me? Yes. Professor? Yes. I, I said, I'm you. having an issue and it's not letting me in. I got into, uh, I got into my book but I can't get into the practice and I can't get into the labs. Okay, we're going to take a look at that. Okay. Rivera, I just sent you the ebook access key via the chat. Okay. okay. I'll pull it up. Yes. Hello, Caitlin. Hi. Um, I sent you an email about my um, code being yes. expired or something. Okay. Yeah, it okay. says my Cert Master product license has expired. So yeah, we're, we're, I tried to log into this. We're going to follow up with that today because we're having okay. different issues with different students with the codes. Okay. Yep. Okay, again. Hello, Dietrich. Hello, Daryl. How are you doing? Good, good. Hello. Hello. Hello, Patricia. Hi, how are you? Good, and you? Just wait a few more minutes uh, for the rest of the students to join and we're going to start shortly.
Okay, let's wait two more minutes and I'm going to start. Okay. Okay, it's 6.06 .06 p.m. I was just giving some time for the rest of the students to join the class. So hopefully uh, we're going to have other students joining shortly. I'm going to admit them to the class. So happy Monday, uh, all of you. So I'm very happy to be here in another Monday night conducting the cybersecurity class. And there is a lot of material that we have to cover. But before I start with the lesson, there's a few items that, that I would like to, to discuss. So let me start with the access keys. So i am been getting different emails from students that there have been some challenges uh, using the access keys and, and getting to the labs and also with, to the eBooks and as well to the practical uh, exercises. So as, as I receive your emails, I'm being forwarding uh, those emails to the coordinator of the program who's, who's helping me to work with Comtia to see what is happening with, with these access keys. They were purchased, they were provided by Comtia, and, and it's important you know, for you to have uh, access to, to the material. So what I'm going to do tonight, I'm going to go one by one. I just want to double check. Uh, what are the challenges that you're facing and see you know, how we can uh, address them. I did receive uh, uh, information from the coordinator that, that contains uh, how to open a help desk ticket with Comtia and also how to call them so that they can do folder troubleshooting when it comes to, to the access keys. So I have all of them, I just want to double check that, that we're using the right links to do the registration and also to, to make sure uh, if you continue with the same issues and if you do, definitely, you know, we want to open a help desk ticket uh, with the Comtia technical support. Okay, so I just want to, to go around and I want to do a quick assessment to see how many students are, are facing uh, issues. So I'm going to, to start, you know, from the students that I have on my screen. So the student that I have on my left uh, is Waivera. So you're the first one that I have on my left. So I, I know that I shared with you the ebook uh, access right. code a few minutes ago. So that's something that I would like you to test sometime tonight to see if you can access them. Okay. But I just want to double check with the labs. Did you have any, any issues with the labs? Yes, the lab I cannot get into. Uh, let me make sure that I'm on the same page. Let me pull up my emails. One second. Mm -hmm. and I will not go the labs is the one that I am not able to get into. The labs, but yeah. the but the question you can get access to the questions, correct? Correct. Okay. Uh, all right. That's good. 
and I will come back to you because I just want to do a quick assessment to see. Okay, Juan, you mentioned that you were having also some issues with the labs as well. Uh, yeah, I don't know where to access the labs. Or I, I haven't been able to like find them anywhere. So, yeah. Okay, but were you able to register? I was able to, I was, I was able to register the first two keys successfully. And like you I already shared my screen last time and you were able to see like I could access all the questions and whatnot. Okay, so I will take a, I will take a look into that as well. Okay, uh, David. I cannot um, register with the access key. It tells me the access code is not valid. Okay, so I will, we'll take a look uh, into that as well. I just wanted to watch it out. We're using the correct links. Okay. Uh, Dietrich? I cannot get into the labs either. That's okay. It. All right, Daryl? Yeah, I've been able to access everything. And um, I had an issue with accessing the lab initially, but it turned out I could turn, I could, uh, register it on the same tab as the ebook. So the same website or the same URL for the ebook, I uh, type in the registration key for the lab. So everyone who's having an issue with that, it'll probably work out for you too. Okay, we're going to, we're going to test that as well, but you have, so far you have access to everything, everything. right? Girl? Okay, good, good. Uh, Caitlin, you mentioned that you're having issues. Yeah, I was able to register everything on Saturday, but then I tried um, today and it wasn't letting me. So I'm going to try to see if I can get it on this computer because I was trying a different computer, but that okay. yeah, wasn't working. Very good. And I'm going to spend some time tonight. I just want to double check that we can do some troubleshooting in the class to see if we can address that. Uh, Lamar, you sent me the email. So I don't know if you have my response uh, with that, but definitely I want to troubleshoot as well. Okay. Uh, Jewel? Um, it's the practice and the labs. I was practice. able to get into the book. Okay. The practice and the labs. You're having the issues. Okay. Right. Good, good. Uh, Patricia? Just the labs. I don't know how to access it. Just the labs. Okay. Uh, Trinita? Yeah, it's the same issue uh, with the labs. With the labs. Okay. Uh, and Jericho, you and I were being exchanging emails. Jericho was basically dealing with the technical support from Compia and the responses that he received. You know, uh, I was a little bit surprised, but Jericho, I'm working with the coordinator of the program and she escalated the email that you received from the Compia technical support. So, so hopefully, you know, we can help you. But it looks like that everyone is having problems with, with the labs, with the exception of Daryl so that there you were able to access everything. Okay. Jericho, did you re receive any folder communication from Comtia with the one, uh, in exception of the one that you already shared with me? Um, yes, sir. Yeah. You, you did? I did, yeah. Okay, and basically no, no solution to the problem. Uh, there is. They, there is. They actually emailed me, yes. Okay, so did you try and then that works? Uh, I'm about to do it right now. Okay, if you can do it and let me know if, uh, if whatever they told you, uh, if that works. So then I just want to double check what, what you did to see if you know we can use that to troubleshoot with the class as well. All right, sir. All right, thank you, Jericho. All right, mm -hmm. so, so that's something that, that is a priority uh, for us to recall. I just want to make sure that we take care you know that situation because you're going to be need uh the access kit you know for this saturday that we're going to have some labs already scheduled all right uh just want to do uh, a quick assessment of where we at you know with the readings i just want to hear directly from you uh where you at and and also that will help me to monitor you know what is the progress with the reading so let me start with Waivera. If you can let us know where we at, where you are. Um, I'm completed um, one, two, and three. I just did my first reading of three. Okay, so you completed three as well? Yeah. Okay, you need to, you know, give you an applause. You know, no, I don't know. That first part was rough. <laughs> so it got better after the first section, but the first section was, oh, I remember now why I did major in computer science. 
Okay, good, good. Uh, thank you. Uh, Juan? Uh, yeah, so I finished one and two already. I'm probably going to do 3A tonight. And yeah, I'll so you, space it out throughout the week. For so you did one and two already, right? Yeah, I already did one and two. One and two. Perfect. Good, good. And you're, you, do you already start three or you're in the, in, in the, in the uh, I'm going to start, I'm planning on starting three after class today. Okay. Perfect. Perfect. Uh, David? You're muted. There we go. I am um, at the beginning of 2B. Okay. I'm almost done with that. I should definitely be finished with that by the end of the evening and start starting with the third chapter. Okay, perfect, perfect. Thanks, David. All right, Dietrich? Yeah, I finished uh, two, so I'm gonna start three this week. Okay, so you're done with one, with two, I'm planning to start with number three. Okay, Daryl? Yeah, I just finished 3A and I'm moving on to uh, the rest of chapter three. All right, good, good. So you're basically number three. Uh, Caitlin? Um, yeah, I did one, two, I started three today. Um, so hopefully you finish that by Wednesday. Okay, perfect. Okay, Lamar? You're muted, Lamar. Still muted. One and two and started three. Okay, one and two started three. Mm -hmm. Okay, Jewel. Completed one and two, started three. Okay, one and two, started three. Patricia. One and two, started three. Okay, same there. Thank you. Tornita. I'm finishing up two, and I should be started on three. Okay. Good, good. Thank you. Jericho? I completed one and two, starting three as well. Okay, perfect. Thank you. So this is very important that on a, on a weekly basis that we double check our goals uh, for the readings. Okay. Now, something that I want to mention to everyone, chapter number three, lesson number three, performing security assessment. Uh, it, it, it will involve a lot of networking terminology. Okay, and, and this is something that you don't need to be an expert on every single network term. So you need to be aware, okay? And what is important is that you understand the different tools that you're going to have available to conduct an assessment and also to be aware and knowledgeable on how to identify uh, the vulnerabilities that you have in your network uh, infrastructure, and also how to use uh, the different uh, topologies that, and also tools that you have from the different sources that, that we're going to be talk, uh, uh, discussing tonight, you know, from the CompTIA ebook, all right? So, so with that being said, let me uh, spend some time. I know that on Saturday, uh, we don't. I don't think that we only have like a five minute break. Or I don't even remember if we took a break on Saturday. So I, I will ask you for a favor. Uh, I'm a person that I can talk, okay? So please, I, I want to establish a rule and I want to be very respectful of your time. And that, you know, I don't want to spend you know, four hours uh, basically just giving you the lecture. It's important for us to take a break so that you can stand, stand up, stretch if you want to have a quick snack. So that's, that's important for, for the class. So this Saturday, uh, we're going to establish the rule just to make sure that someone will say, oh, sorry, Professor Cuevas, you know, we need to take a, a, a quick break because I don't want to, to basically continue with the lecture. I want to respect your, your, your break time uh, with that. Okay. All right, articles. So I know that we did not have the opportunity to, to discuss the articles uh, for, for the class on Saturday. And, and I would like to take some time because it is important that what you're learning, you're going to see that there's different articles, links that contain white, white papers uh, or study cases. And I want you to start getting familiar with those ones so that you can uh, be exposed with the research of what, what happened you know, with other organizations or companies in regards to cybersecurity issues, okay? 
And so on, on the first Saturday, uh, there was a group of students you know, that they participated. And then there were a few students that did not have the opportunity to, to provide their service. So I would like to start with those students that did not have the opportunity on the first Saturday to discuss your, your article. So I would like to ask you know, for any volunteers that, that would like to, to discuss and share you know, what you learned from, from your research. Any volunteers? No volunteers. I will be calling be calling by names. Who who was that? No, I'm saying I was trying to find it. I'm trying to find it now. Okay. All right. Yeah, me too. Okay, yeah. Make sure that you find it because I want to give you some time. So who's ready? Who's ready to, to share? Anyone is ready? I went already. So even though I'm ready, I guess I'm I don't I'm not going this week. So no, I, just, I just want to give the opportunity to other students. Yes. So who's ready? OK, so let me go with, uh, let's see, uh, Jewel. Uh, I can go first. No, or I can you, go first. you want to go first? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I okay. just needed some time to get everything ready because like, there's so much going on, on my screen right now. Professor, I went last week. OK. That's fine. That's fine. That's <laughs> fine. That's fine. I just want to double check, you know, uh, for those students that did not have the opportunity. If not, you know, we will go to the regular ones. Everyone have an article for Saturday, regardless. Also, uh, Professor, yeah. you disabled screen sharing. So, yes. well, let, yeah, it's disabled. Let me give you the access. One second here. One second here, let me. Okay, try now. And you're muted, Juan. Yeah, I just realized I was muted. Sorry. Yes. Um, so my article is more on uh, kind of like a historic event. Okay. And this is about Adobe's kind of one of its largest breaches that it's had in the past. And this one happened in, oh, sorry. Click on something else. Try to find it. There we go. Sorry. So, uh, yeah, there we go. Let's move that over there. And so it happened in 2013 of October 3rd. And essentially, the hackers were able, there, they were able to get access to one of the servers on, of, of Adobe. And from there, they were able to basically infiltrate everything else. They were able to get a whole bunch of passwords, emails, um, and they were able to actually uh, decrypt a lot of it. And another thing that I learned from this is I never realized that you could actually um, get like source code for the apps that they made. And that's, that's just something I kind of like, it, I didn't realize that you know, like a company that makes apps, you can also steal their apps by doing so. Like, it's not only like the credentials, you steal what they make. Because, yeah, um, so that's something else that happened. I believe it was uh, Cold Fusion, uh, Cold Fusion web app, Adobe Acrobat, and Adobe Reader. And also Photoshop was later found to be decrypted and found online as well. So those three big apps were found to, you know, like they're, they were available online and the, the source code, so you could just download it. And so what uh, Adobe ended up doing was they offered free credit monitoring to all the people who got their, uh, their, their, you know, like their credentials released. And I don't know, like, that's the best I could do, honestly. And so that, well, obviously that was not enough. So uh, it's not in this article, but uh, another like follow-up article is that there were around, I think there were 15 states that were majorly affected and they all ended up suing for a million dollars uh, Adobe for the damage that was caused. And that amounts to around, I believe, like $2.80 for every account that was potentially harmed. And yeah, so that's kind of what I got from this article. And once again, it was more of just kind of like a historic event that I found. 
So as you can see, and this is for the for the class to be aware, Adobe is a company that they do have the resources to have a solid network infrastructure. This is not just like a regular a small size company or mid-size company. Adobe is a large uh, corporation. So here is a perfect example that no one is exempt when it comes you know, to breaches. Yeah. And, and, and in this case, uh, it was Jericho, uh, uh, Juan, you mentioned that it was one of their uh, server that got uh, compromised. And in that server, they were able to get information about Cold Fusion, uh, Adobe products, and also users, yeah. a pa usernames and passwords, correct? Yeah, it, it was more of like an entry way. Like they got access to that server and then through like that server, they were able to essentially access everything else. Right. Or at least that kind of sector of the kind of like area. By any chance, do you know if this server was uh, a server that it was hosted by Adobe or it was in the cloud? Uh, I'm not sure about it. I'm okay. pretty sure it was one of Adobe's servers, so I don't, I don't think Adobe's it was server. hosted in the cloud. Yeah. Okay. And the other part for everyone to be aware is what are the consequences here? So Juan, if you mentioned, I believe there were a few states that actually sued Adobe and they won. And I believe they were able to collect like one million dollar. Yeah, then, it was a million dollars. And then whoever uh, was impacted, they received like a, a few dollars, like two dollars and something eighty-two cents. Yeah. You say? Yeah, it was around like almost three dollars, so like two dollars and eighty cents. But almost three dollars. But when you have they, like a million citizens and whatnot, that's like a lot. Yes, and also they got uh, credit reports protection for one year. Yeah. So when you look at that, uh, you know, $1 million, you know, for, for a company of that magnitude is a lot of money. And, and in top of that, then they need to provide a full year of service for, for credit reports. And if you already know, credit reports, uh, depending on of, of what services you're, you're buying, you know, it can cost, you know, for like $10, $15, $30 per month, uh, depending on the on services that that they select. And so this is very serious, there are consequences. And, and this is what is important that when you're dealing with different vendors, that one of the area that you explore is how they're going to react in the case that their system get compromised and how they're going to uh, support you know, the, the customers if you're getting services to, uh, through them, okay? So just uh, just keep that in mind. Thank you, uh, Juan, for sharing this article. Uh, they have vulnerabilities, you know, with this server. And in, in the class that we're going to cover tonight, lessons number three, which is performance security assessment. This is one of the topics that, that we're going to discuss is how companies should conduct uh, security assessments and also what tools they should use to keep their systems uh, protected to the best of their capabilities. And again, no one is exempt uh, from, from a data breach or from an attack. And I just want you to, to be fully aware of that. There is no a perfect company. There is not a software solution that I will say, we're going to cover your network infrastructure 100%. I never, Heard a company like that, and if you have a sales rep that is telling you that, I would not buy that product. To be very honest with you, because there is nothing that is a hundred percent secure uh, when it, when it comes to network uh, protection. There is there is no so, no no such company that will provide you a hundred percent guarantee. Okay. Any questions for Juan from the class? Are there any questions that that you may have about his article? I have something I just I saw at the bottom one that it said that consumers always that they had the option to um, security freeze, put a security freeze on their credit. But what if their credit was hit? What if somebody got a hold of their credit? Did they say what Adobe did for them? I mean, say I freeze my credit. So but then someone still was able to get my social security. I think, uh that goes more on an individual basis because like if yeah like if you if like maybe like all a handful of people got that issue they would like take it on with uh, adobe one-on-one -on -one. i don't think that 
they offered any services to like people who were, were already affected because from what I remember, they Adobe actually acted pretty quickly. So like they, they found out of the breach and they, they did all they could uh, to, you know, uh, make sure that anyone who was compromised was secured. And, and Joel, that's a, that's a good question. Yeah. Uh, when, when it comes to the financial issues, is let's say, for example, that through this company, through this breach, now your banking account get compromised, right? That's your concern. That's your question. Yes. So, yes. So, so if your banking account gets compromised, uh, all the banks in the United States, they are uh, insured by the FDIC. I don't know if you're familiar with, with them. So every time when you enter to a bank, you will see a sticker that it will say FDIC uh, certified. And what that means that the FDIC will protect your account, uh, I believe it's up to $100,000. So if your account get compromised, let's say under that range, so you're going to be protected. Now, what happened if the financial situation is over $100,000? That's when the problem will come. Because the, the bank, basically the FDIC, it will protect you for the first $100,000. If it's more than that, then it's going to uh, basically require any other legal actions with the company or the vendor who caused the, the data breach. So that's why these companies, they want to respond quickly because they know there's limitations. And if they, if they exceed those limitations, it will heavily affect the financials uh, to them. And, and they don't want to do that. Yeah. And yeah. Also, the, the paragraph before the last one talks about um, fraud alerts, which you can put on your credit file so that nobody can open new credit in your name without them calling you first. And if you can demonstrate that you've had identity theft, then they'll leave that on your account for seven years versus 90 days. Yes. So that's also a really good thing to do about making sure that people aren't opening up credit in your name. Right. And that's, that's, that's a good observation. Uh, let me ask here in the class, how many of you have been exposed to identity theft? So I, I see one. Let me just change my view here. Uh, give me one second. I'm changing here my view. So it was one. Can, can you please raise your hand? Whoever said I was being exposed to identity theft? Just one student. Okay. So, so yes, I I know what is the what is the feeling. My identity was stolen a few years ago, and I, I found out because I received a phone call from a debt collector and they were, they were telling me that I was behind four months with my Comcast uh, cable services. And when I received the phone call and I said, you sure you had the right person? And they say, yes, you know, this is your name. So yes, that's my name. So this is your home address. So yes, that's my home address. And they said that you live in Texas. And I say, no, I don't live in Texas. At that time, I was in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. I say, I'm, I'm in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, so I don't have nothing to do, you know, in, in Texas. And and that's when they told me, you know, uh, someone opened uh, a Comcast account and they're running behind uh, on four months. So what I did when I uh, learned about that, uh, I called the police, I make a police report, I then contact Equifax, TransUnion, and there is one more experience. So I, I contact the three different credit uh, credit providers and you file a report and you need to upload your police case number. And with that, they will basically protect you for seven years at no cost, which was, was great. But what was painful that for the first, I believe it was 120 days, it was very painful that every time when you try to go to the gas station to put gas or go to the supermarket to buy something with your debit card or, or credit card, they will call you 
and and you will need to say yes it's me please authorize this process so just imagine you're in the supermarket or you're at the, at, at the gas station trying to put gas and you need to wait for that phone call just to say yes it's me so that was basically the part that I say it, it's great that you have that service but it was painful that now you had the dependency that you need to validate that that, that is you okay so that's why you have those services you know no one is exempt that happened to me once and since that experience you know I put a lot of credit uh, protection on my own just to make sure that that I'm protected and also that my family is protected as well. Okay. All right. Uh, thank you very much, Juan, you know, for sharing the article with us. All right. Who would like to go next? Who's ready? I'll go. All right. Can you share your screen, Patricia? Yes. Can you see it? Yes, we can see it. We, we cannot see the the title, but we can see, the there we go, now now we can see the title. Yeah, um, the White House wants companies to step up cyber security, we can't do it alone. So, um, well, recently we've seen what's been going on with the gas line, um, the neo transit systems, gas pipes. And so now the president was um, urging the companies to make sure that um, the, the security is tight and to make sure that um, they, they're protecting themselves against cyber you know, attacks and all these things because it, it's been, it, it's gonna be here for some time. It's not like it's gonna disappear right quick. And so they have to make sure, companies have to make sure that they're doing what they can in their best ability to make sure that their systems are um, safe. Well, like, like we always say, no systems are safe or to make sure that at least, you know, um, they're protecting themselves so that nothing or um, no attacks will be able to um, come forth. Because I believe that if certain measures can be taken or if certain things can be done, then um, cyber attacks can be prevented. You know, like sometimes certain things like little things that, you know, we don't think that or companies don't believe that it can be a threat that's um that's the same way or it can be an avenue that the enemy or it can be a loophole that the enemy or um or, or an attack could come through so um talked about certain things that some companies could do that they just have to make sure that they are backing up their systems daily you know they have to make sure that at least they have um they have um what is it called the um authentication or yeah what is it let me see i think it was here so they have to make sure that they have all that in place so that um you know like the endpoint detection and response encryption and skilled security team and all that they have to make sure that all these things are in place and once they have all these things in place at least we can know that um it, it, a threat can be prevented and um things like that okay that will be it and, and patricia you this situation, you know, with the ransomware that happened in the last few weeks, they're not going to stop. As, as, as we learned on the Saturday class, with the maps that I share with the different attacks that, that are happening globally, so it's every day. Every day there is an attack. Some attacks are more popular than others, but every day, every hour, every minute, as at, the mom at this moment, someone is conducting an attack uh, through, through the network. And you as a cybersecurity practitioner, you need to be aware that when hackers conduct cyber attacks, they also look for your backups, okay? So your backups that you have, your data backups that you have in your, in, in, in your network infrastructure, I just want to make sure that you're clear with something. Those backups are there not to help you when you have an attack. Okay, so what is, the, what is the purpose of a data backup? And I just want to make sure that, that all of you understand what, you know, the, the difference, you know, when, when you have backups versus no backups. So why you have first, why you need backups on the first place in, in, in organizations? What is the purpose of a data backup? Well, so that in 
if anything happens, you can always go back and retrieve it or like restore. Not where everything happened. It's Let's not. It. It's not where anything happened. No, no, no. There's there's a specific reasons why you have data backup. Um, In case of hardware, prevent, like any data loss or. Okay, so you mentioned data loss, Lamar. What did you mention? If the hardware fails. Okay, so in the case of data loss, hardware fail, uh, anything else that someone else would like to share? I was about to say something about like archives, um, having um, um, copies of archives and um, folders and stuff like that. Um, is that wrong? No, but that's, that's your backup. It's still your backup. Okay. But basically, the, the, the reason why you have your backup, yes, and, and, and you will, if you're meaning that you want to have data backups for the archive data, for the archive folder, yes, that's the reason yes. to have, yes, that's the reason yes, to that's have data, yes, yes, that's the reason to have data backups. So in, in the case that, that you have missing files, so that's when data backups will help you. In the case that you have a hardware failure, that's when the data backups will come in place and help you. In the case that you have a corrupted file, that's when the data backups will come in place. Now, data backups will not help you if you have a cyber attack. Because hackers, when they're conducting cyber attacks, they also look for your backups and, and basically corrupt your data and infect you know, your data with malicious uh, activities. What is going to prevent that is basically the configurations and procedures that you're going to have in place and the training that your staff will have. That's what is going to prevent uh, the, the cyber attacks and also how you're going to mitigate. And so please, please keep in mind that a cyber attack can damage your data backups. Keep, keep that in mind. So for that reason, there are companies that they have uh, a data backup, and then they have a backup of that backup on an isolated system that no one have access and is not connected to a network. So in the in the case that there is a, a cyber attack and the data gets destroyed, they have that data on a physical location, basically on an external hard drive that is not connected to nothing. They just did the backup, uh, let's say, there are companies that they do backups on a daily basis, other companies they do backups on a weekly basis, other companies they do backups every two weeks, and there are companies that they do backups every 30 days. And what they do, they remove those hard drive and they say, okay, this hard drive are on, on this location in the case that something happened, they're not connected even to a computer. They're just right there isolated in the case that something happens, okay? So, so just, just keep that in mind. So going back to Patricia's article. So Patricia, if you can go to the title, please, of your article. So it's basically is saying White House warns companies to step up cybersecurity. We cannot do it alone. So the, the message is clear here. The government cannot do this alone. Okay. If you can see companies like Adobe as, as Juan Share, they got compromised and they do have the resources, you know, to have a, a, a great network infrastructure and they do have it, but no one is exempt here. And, and that's why the knowledge that you're acquiring in this class is going to put you in a great position, you know, in the near future uh, to provide basically knowledge to, to any organization. Okay. So keep this in mind. Uh, the government will not, uh, be able to f basically to pro to cover every single company in the United States. The government basically will, will create regulations, laws, it will provide training, it will provide procedures, but they're not going to have a cybersecurity engineer basically monitoring your network in your company. They're not going to do that. They don't have the capability or the resources to do that. Okay, and that's not the function you know, of the, of the government as well. So that's the responsibility of the, of the company. Okay. Any questions to Patricia or any comments about her article? I was wondering, I had a question about, uh, in, in the case of the, 
that are in her article that company, the pipeline company and with Adobe. Uh, with Adobe is like millions of uh, records of uh, user data. So when that kind of data is leaving the network, is there some kind of uh, best practices that identifies when secure user data is going out at two, you know, because they can't take it all out at once because of the bandwidth. And it would, uh, it sh certainly has to have some kind of signature that you're taking a database that's, you know, with user information, why is that going out at that speed and that much? Uh, so is there any way to stop that or to identify that in the network? Anyone would like to help with that, with, with the answer to that question? Any, any thought? That's a great question, Lamar. Can, can you identify uh, if data has been transferred you know, outside of your, of your systems and, and also how you can, if you can stop it? And so and any thought about that question you know, that Lamar asked? What, what the class you know, think? What are, what are your, your, your comments about that question? I, I think if you do have like, um, like if it's a site, so let's say um, like the company that does that, you can't get the report of that, but, and, and you might be able to stop it. Maybe it is it's possible. So Patricia said that it may be, that maybe you can stop it. Okay, so who else would like to share, you know, your, your thought? Do you think that is possible to, or how? Let me ask the question. How do you think that we can stop the data transfer? How we can stop it? I mean, I think that for me, it's like, the, like, the reason why I don't really know is because there's just so many ways to transfer data. Like you can physically transfer it like either to a USB drive, you can tra like transfer it online, you can transfer it to like another computer and then transfer it online. Or like, you, like there's just so many, I feel like there's just so many ways that, that you can just move information around. And especially when you have a company that already moves a ton of information between like different networks, different servers, et cetera, it's hard to be like, okay, but which one of those is not right? Right, but that's the responsibility of the companies. That's why we as consumers will, will trust on the company. And in some cases, we're going to pay for services. So Lamar, going back to your question, to, to your answer, yes, it's possible and, and it's practical, okay? And so companies, they need to understand the topography of the network infrastructure. In order for you to understand the topography of your network infrastructure, you need to understand how your network infrastructure is being designed. Now that you understand how your network infrastructure is being designed, and that includes not only the physical hardware, but also that includes uh, the infrastructure that you have, and also the application software that you have, the operating system that you have in place, and the configuration that you have, in those operating systems is, is basically you need to conduct an assessment to validate that first that the design that you have in your network uh, infrastructure is is following best practices now that you validate that the design is good then you're going to look at the configuration of all the different appliances that you have and also the configuration for all the different operating systems and application software that that you have in place once you have that in, in, in place that you know okay, everything is configured, you know, following best practices, there are tools, and I'm going to share some of those tools here. There are tools that are going to help you as a cybersecurity practitioner to run what is called a baseline report. Okay, so a baseline report is going to tell you the health of your network infrastructure. So when everything is working fine and, and you can see, okay, the configuration is good, the topology is good, the, the systems are communicating, the right uh, users have the right uh, access. So you create a baseline report. 
that baseline report is going to reflect that you do not have any unauthorized users on your network, but not only unauthorized users on your network is going to be reflected. Also, you're going to see that there are not services in, in, in your appliances uh, or users that are not authorized on that baseline report. So basically, whatever you see in that baseline report is being approved. Now, when your system gets compromised, what you're going to do, you're going to uh, run another report, you're going to scan your systems, and now you're going to compare. Okay, I have my baseline report that this is when my systems are clean. Now I'm going to compare my second scanning, my second report with my baseline. And I'm going to see if there are any differences. And what is going to happen, you're going to start looking, okay, why the network is too slow? Okay, this account is being transferring data uh, outside of, of, of the network or inside of the network. Let me look my baseline report. Okay, I don't have that on my baseline report, but now I have it on my new scan, new report that I run. So right there, now I have a piece of information that is going to help me to determine uh, what is causing that. That's one, one section that you can start looking into the problem, okay? Then you're going to be looking at services. And so if I share, let me, let me share my screen very quick. Let me, let me do a quick, a quick share. Can you see my screen? Yes, all right, so what I'm going to do, uh, task manager, can you see my task manager? Yes. Yes, you can see my task manager here, right? Let me, let me open my Word document. I have a, a, a background on top of my task manager, so it's gonna be better. Okay, so here's my task manager, okay? So when I'm looking at my task manager, this is just locally on my computer, okay? You can do the same thing on your servers, regardless if you have a Windows server, a Linux server, or an Apple server, so it doesn't, it doesn't matter. So you can, you can check the, the different application that you have. So if you can see, based on my task manager, I have different tabs. I had the processes, performance, app history, startup, users, details, and services. So I have eight apps that I can basically manually, I can end. If I make a right click, I can end the task uh, and, and, I have any, and I have other activities that I can do as well, like switch to or provide feedback. But basically I have the flexibility that I can terminate this task. And so, so I can see the task that I'm running. I can see uh, the CPU usage, the memory RAM that is taken, the hard disk drive, and the consumption of the network. So if I can see that something is like 85% of 90% from here, right there, I'm going to be able to see what is the application. So you follow me so far, Lamar, you know, on, on how, how we can start looking into this. Wouldn't Hang your uh, IDS and your IPS be the best solution? Because they would automatically tell you something that's outside of your uh, baseline. It's going and to be then the IPS would yes. probably do, take an active stand saying, hey, we the rules say don't send data out or if the usage gets this high. Yes, Lamar, yes. And but it's going to be a combination of tools. Okay. So you can use that, but you don't want to limit yourself just to those to those commands and to those tools. There's other tools that you want to use. Uh, with this one, you can monitor the performance. And you can see what is the performance on the device. Here I can see the app history, uh, what I have on my startup, who are the users. So this one I, I can see that basically it's just it's just one user. If I see multiple users here, I'm going to be able to see you know who's this who's this person or or if this person have or this account you know have access to the system. Then there's additional details about the different applications that are running. So as you can see, there's a bunch of applications that are running here. And then the services. So these services is basically everything that is running. Uh, if I click on a status, so you're going to see it, what is running behind the scenes. All these services that you see here, 
are running right now uh, in the middle of my class that are running behind the scenes. So that's why as a cybersecurity practitioner, you need to be very familiar. Okay, what are the services that you're going to have in your appliances? And when I'm saying appliances, I mean your, your firewall, your switches, uh, your routers, your access points, your desktops, your laptops, your cell phones. So you need to do what is called an X-ray of your network infrastructure. So when when you go, let, let's just make, let me elaborate more on this X-ray. There are times that when you're not feeling well and you go to the doctor and you tell the doctor, hey, I have some pain, but I don't know what is it. The doctor basically is going to take that feedback from you and going to say, okay, in order for, for, for me to know more about your human body, I need to do an X-ray. So in cybersecurity, you're going to take the same approach and you're going to do an X-ray of your network infrastructure. How you do an X-ray is with the use of different tools that I'm going to be covering on lesson three. Lamar, that was a great question. And I really appreciate it you know, that, that, that you asked that question to the class because that actually covers what we're going to be talking uh, on, on, on lesson number three. Okay, okay thank I, you for your answer. No, no, I hope that that provide you, you know, a, a quick overview basically of, of that. And yes, to answer to your question, yes, you can, you can identify it and, and you can uh, prevent it uh, as well. Okay. All right, let me stop my presentation. Okay, I would like to go to have time for one more student so that we can do the one more article. Who would like to go next? I'll go. Okay. <clears throat> okay, are you sharing your screen? That's what I'm trying to do right now. Okay, let me double check that everyone have access to share. Yes. Okay. Is it's at the bottom you have uh, next to you have it's called share screen. Yeah, I don't know. it's not a it's not a line. Oh my god, here we go again. It's okay. So did you upload it into Brightspace, Jericho? Oh there, there we go. Yes. Okay. So we can see the, the beautiful mountain with the ocean. <laughs> <laughs> Where's my, the, one, one of those? Are, uh, there, there it is. Can you see it? Uh, it's coming. Yeah. Yes. We can see it. Yes. Okay. Um, this is the title. It's a U.S. Cybersecurity Agency or CISA alert. Foreign train actors continue to target on pets vulnerabilities. So... These are AP advanced persistent threat actors sponsored by nation states like China and Iran. Typically they target unpatched vulnerabilities across government agencies and US-based networks, specifically the networking devices and mail server software. And these are the products. False Connect Secure, False Connect Secure, Citrix, if you're familiar with this. It's just very similar, it's like a webinar. Um, Microsoft Exchange Server, and Mapify BIP. Um, oh, okay, um, what else? Um, they also attack the commercial uh, VPN, virtual private network. Like he, like he said before, not whenever you uh, um, buy or, or you rent a service from a cybersecurity company or cybersecurity firm, there's no 100% bulletproof that you're not gonna get attacked. So, and another thing about this, um, 
um, regarding this article, um, how do you say, oh, where's the one that I saw here? Yeah, then this, uh, these are disclosed by, if you're familiar with Black Hat and DEPCON conferences. So typically these two are occur in Las Vegas. Do you know, we do conferences every year. Okay, um, oh, what else do we have? I'm not gonna go to every one of them. That's pretty much it. So I go, I'm just gonna go with the big picture. I'm not gonna get into details. So, and Jerry, go. Uh, if, yes. if you can go back to the title of the, of the yeah. article. And basically, if you can see, threat actors continue to target on patch vulnerabilities. Mm -hmm. and, and what I want you to, to keep in mind as a cybersecurity practitioner, that vulnerabilities, they're not only on application software, they're also on patch vulnerabilities on operating systems, Windows, Linux, Apple. Uh, they, they also ha have vulnerabilities. And, and there is a perception, there is a perception that I want you to be aware as a cybersecurity practitioner. There are still individuals that believe that nothing happened to apples. They say, oh, Apple computers, they don't get viruses, okay? And the Apple operating system, uh, yes, they're very solid. They have great security. But I just want to let everyone that no one, no one is exempt, okay? When it comes to unpatched vulnerabilities, you can have operating systems that are no longer supported, okay? And companies decided to continue using those operating systems. Let me just give you a good example. Windows XP, okay? Or Windows 2000. Windows XP is an outdated operating system. Windows 2000 is an outdated operating system. Windows 98, Windows 95. So those are, if you, if you can hear now, I'm telling you operating systems that are like 20 years old. Unfortunately, there are still companies that they use Windows XP as an operating system because they have the mentality, nothing will happen to us. And, and now they're using this on patch operating system that are no longer supported. And those are the companies that basically that will get, you know, uh, an attack. Because hackers are always looking, you know, for outdated operating systems. Just, just keep that in mind. And the point I'm trying to make here is that as a cybersecurity practitioner, when you do an assessment in your organization, you want to look for the version of the operating system that you have. And you want to look for the version of all the application software that you use in your organization. And then it's going to be your responsibility to validate, okay, this is all the different operating system that we have in our organization. Which one are considered outdated? And those ones are the ones that you need to mitigate and remove them from your network. And then you're going to do the same with the different application software that you have. You're going to see that they're going to have application software that according to their vendor are no longer supported. So those application software are vulnerable. So those are the basically the low hanging fruit uh, activities that you can do as a cybersecurity practi uh, practitioner is to just to conduct a quick assessment, a quick security assessment. And that's basically asking, asking two questions. What are the operating systems that we have in our organization and, and the version? And what are all the application software that we have in our infrastructure under versioning? When you ask those two questions, you're going to get pushback from your system teams. But they're the one that will need to perform these activities. And they're going to see, oh, don't worry, everything, everything is fine. We have everything up to date. Let me just give you an advice. You need to have in writing and you need to conduct that assessment. And it's not to point fingers at nobody and, and basically that you don't trust on, on their work. Is that if you're the cybersecurity practitioner for the organization, you need to do your own assessment. 
uh, what I have learned from my professional career when people, you know, when I conduct those assessments, they say, oh, no, Josue, everything's up to date. Uh, we, we don't have any systems, you know, in our organization that are updated. And I said, fine, that, that's great. Uh, and, and I do trust you, but I need to do my own assessment. Uh, and basically I need to come with my own reports. So let's run these tools. And when we run the tools, uh, said so that we found three devices. So they have 30,000 devices and we found three that basically that were outdated. And basically they say, oh, I don't know how that happened. And that's fine, I'm not here to point fingers. I'm glad that we found this together. So now let's see where these systems are because this is what is going to happen. When, when people know that you're running an assessment, that, that you're doing a security assessment, those people that know that they have all devices, they're going to turn them off. And when you're running the assessment, your assessment would not discover nothing because those systems, you already give them the warning, hey, I'm going to be doing an assessment. What they're going to do, they're going to turn off the devices. And when you run the assessment, you're not going to be able to see it. So when you perform a security assessment, you're, going, you're not going to tell nobody. You're going to run your assessment and you're going to see what is out there. Okay. So, and, just keep keep that in mind that outdated equipment, they're going to be on patch. And, and please be aware that only you need one device. Only you need one device to basically compromise your network. Just one, just one computer. That's what you need, one computer. So just, just keep keep that in mind. Any questions, you know, for, for Jericho, you know, for, for this article, any questions, comments, observations that you would like to share? Any comments? Nope. Okay, Jericho, thank you very much, you know, for sharing this, you know, with the class. And we're going to cover this in, in the class tonight. Okay. So if you can see these articles, you know, are, are very helpful. So that actually they are related with the topics that we're covering in the class and actually help us to start being an open minded and start thinking, okay, there is a lot that is, that is happening. All right, so what I want to do next, because uh, I'm, I'm going to start working with lessons number three. Let me share with you, let me share my screen very quick. Let me know if you can see my screen. Yes, okay, on lesson number three, we're going to cover uh, performance security assessment. And this topic is going to cover a lot of networking terms. And, and if you're not familiar with networking, with network terms or how network, infrastructure are designed or configured, you don't need to be an expert, okay? But it is something that eventually in, in your career, okay? Eventually in your career that you want to be familiar with, okay? So I just want to share with you a Professor Messer. I don't know if you're familiar with Professor Messer. Okay, so Professor Messer, so if you Google Professor Messer, uh, you will see that they, that Professor Messer covers a lot of different topics. Uh, basically, A plus, uh, network, uh, cybersecurity, and other and other ones. So, in the network training, so they have free network videos, and also they have uh, network uh, courses as well. Let me just close this. And here. So you're going to see the different topics for, let's say net, network, this is Comtia Network Plus. And here basically section zero, the N1007 Network Plus exam. And they have different explanation about different terms that I'm going to be using tonight in the class, like IPs, uh, common ports, uh, switching, uh, we're going to discuss net network segmentation, uh, switch, uh, static or, or dynamic IP addresses, the static or dynamic routing, 
how to configure an IP version four versus an IP version six. And so let me just share this link in the chat. And this is more for you as a reference, okay? This is at some time in your career in the future. If you say, you know, I would like to learn a little bit more about Network Plus. So here you have some uh, free videos that, that you can use uh, for your own benefit. And let me come here to chat. Chat. Okay. And let me share this with everyone. So what I just share with you in the in the chat, so you have the link there for Professor Messer. So make sure that you bookmark uh, this page. And they have great resources. Uh, they have a lot of free material. And, and it is uh, Professor Messer, you know, he's very recognized in, in the industry. And so if you want to learn something quick, for like a terminology, if you can see, there, there are sections, they're like 30 minutes, eight minutes, four minutes, three minutes, two minutes. So it, it depends of what you would like to, of what you would like to learn, okay? At the same time, you know, he has a, a cybersecurity part. If I click here on the free videos, so you have other videos about different sections, if you would like to review, review those videos, but again, you already have a lot of material. You have the ebook from Comtia. You're going to have access to the to the portal, and this is more, you know, as a as a supplement in the case that you would like to to watch, you know, a video or something in particular. So you will have that available as well as a supplement. Okay, but I don't want I don't want you to be basically, you know, getting a lot of information from different places. So we have a structure, we're using the Comtia structure and I would like to, to stay with that one, you know, for, for the class, okay? So for the networking piece, so you already know where you can find information if you want to learn more about the different terminology. So you will have that there. You don't need to, for this class, you don't need to be an expert uh, in, in networking. I just want to make sure that you, that you understand that. But if, if it's important that you're familiar with the term, but you don't need to be an expert uh, on them. Okay. All right. So make sure that you copy that link that you bookmark, you know, that link. Okay. All right. So lessons number three, uh, performing security assessment. So when you hear that you're going to perform a security assessment, you know, what comes to your mind? Let's see, David, what comes to your mind when you hear performing security assessment? What is that? You're muted, David. Uh, from a general perspective, it's really just assessing the, the type of security protocols that an organization has in place, um, going over the security statements and seeing what kind of hardware, software, they're using what kind of data they're using, what kind of security is necessary, I suppose. Okay, so basically, is to con to understand uh, the security processes that you have in your organization. You mentioned how's the data configured, how the system configured, things like that. Correct. Correct. Okay. Good. Good. Thank you, Caitlin. What do you understand? You know, for performing security assessment. Yeah, I mean, pretty much what David said, just kind of trying to find holes um, in the system or trying to find, um, sorry, any, um, yeah, any weaknesses and trying to see where, you know, vulnerabilities lie in the system. So as to find any holes, any weaknesses, you know, that you have in your, in your infrastructure. Good, good, good. Okay, Lamar, what is your understanding for performing security assessment? I think uh, my understanding would be um, it de depend. Uh, is the company like hiring us just to find out what their baseline is, or are they hiring us just to see how vulnerable they are? Do we need to do a pen test? So I would sit down with them and ask them, uh, you know, what what do you guys want us to do? How far do you want us to go? Good, 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 Lamar. So basically, you mentioned something important: pen testing. 
how you want to conduct pen testing and so how you can do assessments. Mm -hmm. So if you can see, you know, this is a new student in the class and I was sitting that Caitlin have her, her uh, doc, you know, next to her. So this is Rocky, just for everyone. <laughs> He's next to me all the time. All right, so, so yes, Lamar, you know, conducting penetration testing. So Lamar, when you mentioned penetra penetration testing, what, you know, what are the benefits of that? Why you want to do that? You say, when do I want to do no. it or why? Why, why? Okay. Uh, well, I want to know uh, just how, how hard is my network to break into? Okay. Well, the thing is you have uh, different companies because some companies, it depends on the size. You, want, you, you have this huge attack surface, but there are things you don't know you don't know. Mm -hmm. And that pen testing normally should give you that, or, you know, it could tell you, uh, it could tell you all sorts of things. It could tell you, there's one pen test where you're testing either the network, just the network, see how I can get a network. If I can take credentials and I can raise credential. And uh, then there's uh, on your website, do I have cross-site scripting in there? Uh, you know, what are my vulnerabilities? And in uh, which one, and then they give you a list of, you know, the ones that they think are uh, the most dangerous to your network or, or the most um, exploitable. Okay. So, and actually, you know, we'll open the discussion now for, for lessons number three. And, and yes, Lamar, you know, you want to conduct uh, penetration testing. You used to basically to test, you know, how good is the configuration that you have how robust it is, and also how difficult it is going to, to conduct an attack. And, and just for the benefit of the class, to, to do a data breach, to conduct an attack, is not an easy task, okay? This is something that needs to be planned. This is something that you need to have good knowledge of how to use the different tools. Uh, it's not impossible, but it's not easy. And you're going to learn once we get the hands on in the different labs, uh, it's a combination of different tools that that you have available, and then you need to decide what are the tools that you want to use. And and normally you want to conduct a penetration test. Uh, you want to do one on your own, so that you can basically see where you at. You do then the quick adjustment. Once you do the quick adjustment, that's when we hire a third party company to do a penetration testing. And, and that actually will help us to understand what we miss or if there's, if, or if there's any areas that we did not consider. So just keep in mind that as a cybersecurity practitioner, when you're in your network infrastructure, you understand everything and you see everything. Just imagine your house. You live in your house and you know everything from A through C and you believe that everything is working fine in your house and you believe that everything is secure in your house. And now you say, okay, I want to, to bring someone to do, a, to do an assessment of my house. And then when they come, they're going to start listing areas that you say, I never considered about that. I never think about that because you live there. And when someone comes from the outside to do that assessment, they're going to actually provide you additional information that is going to help you to take uh, decisions, not because a company will come to your house and, and tells you that you need to change everything or build a house, you know, from, 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 the, from scratch, you will do it. You will take decision from there. And then based on the resources that you have, that's how you're going to, to approach the situation. I just want you to, to use that analogy, you know, as, as an example, your network is your home and, and, and you have a good understanding and you do the best to, to keep everything up to date and con to configure. And when you bring someone from the outside, they're going to be looking for other areas that that it will help you to do to have a, a more robust system. Is the uh, pen testing? It involves. Uh, is it like a black hat and a gray hat? But I, I can't remember which one is the one where they give you some of the information, or and then the one where you don't have any information and you try to hack in. So basically, when when you do a penetration testing, uh, you you will have an, it's, it's, it's an ethical hacker, okay? So the ethical hacker will, will do the activities and they will provide you a full report 
of everything that you need to do to improve it. And also they will come with recommendations of what, of what you need to do. There are security companies that they will do the penetration testing at no cost for free. But keep in mind, these security companies, they have solutions that they want to sell. And, and the price, yeah, is free from one area, but then they want to sell you their products. So that's why it is important to find an independent uh, penetration test uh, person that will not be selling any products. Now, in cybersecurity, in this class, you're going to do you're going to conduct a, a penetration testing. You still let you know you're going to go through that experience. And there are students that they will say, you know, this is fun, this is like, and and there are students that will say, I would I, I would like to do this as a part time. And then you can basically conduct penetration testing for different companies. And then you can make recommendations based on your findings. And, and there are students and there, I, I have uh, friends, co-workers that as a part-time job on the site, they do penetration testing. And, and it's something that you can do, you know, uh, as a part-time job, if you want to. There are other individuals that they do this as a, as a full-time job, okay? Let me let me share with you an experience. Uh, one of my best friends, he was he was a penetration test for the the cruise lines for Royal Caribbean for Princess, and every time when I when I see him, you know, I say, man, you had the, the perfect job, and 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 basically he got overwhelmed and he got tired of the job. So basically, his job was to go on a cruise line to be a cruise path passenger. So he will go to Port Everglades in, in uh, Fort Lauderdale. He will get into a cruise. He will spend seven days in the cruise as a guest. So people would not know that he was basically an ethical hacker hired by the company. He will be with his laptop. And in seven days, he will spend basically on a daily basis, a few hours trying to hack the communications the payment systems, the mechanical uh, room of the ship. So he was conducting different activities. And, and he did that for three years. And, and he, he was basically with a great salary, but he said, man, I want to spend time with my family. It's like every time I'm, I'm traveling from one port to a different port to a different port and up to the point that at the beginning it was the best job ever. But after two years, you know, he was getting overwhelmed because he was out you know, from his family. So just to let you know that there's a lot of opportunities there. Then he changed with, uh, basically with um, uh, aviation. Then he started doing penetration testing, you know, with aviation. He was traveling from airport to airport. He did it for three years. And then he said, I want to be with my family again. And now he's working, you know, his base in Florida and, and he's an engineer. And that was a great experience for him to understand, you know, uh, different areas, you know, for different companies. Just to let you know that what you're going to learn, you know, in these lessons about penetration testing and the tools, that it is fun uh, also to discover, you know, what companies are doing and also how you can help them, that that's the most important. Once you discover their vulnerabilities, how you're going to help them, you know, to, to get better, okay? All right, so let me share my screen. my presentation and then let me do a quick swap in here all right so lessons number three uh performing security assessment okay so in 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 this topic right here so we're going to learn about a specific tools we're going to learn about vulnerability assessment and also and also penetration testing some of the topics that, that I'm going to be covering on lesson number three, basically assess organizational security with network, recognize uh, tools, explain security concerns with general vulnerability types, summarize vulnerability scanning techniques, and then ex explaining you know, penetration testing concepts. And I'm going to share you know, the different tools that you have that you have available. Okay. So topic 3A, assess organizational security with network, 
recognizance tools. Uh, so what is going to happen here? In this section, we're going to, when you see the word recognizance tools, uh, you're going to be looking, you're going to be watching, uh, you're going to be observing for different data packets, you know, how packets are, are, are moving in your organization. Uh, you're going to have tools that you're going to be familiar with. So how you can get statistics about how a packet, you know, was transferred. Uh, so you're going to see different examples of that. Okay. Uh, I'm going to show you different links that will have different articles, tools that you can download so that you can use those tools to do security assessment. Then the syllabus objective that we're going to cover is going to be section 4.1, giving a scenario with the appropriate tool to assess organizational uh, security. Okay. All right. And let's just start with some of the topics. Okay. So you're going to start learning about different uh, commands that you can use when you're using different operating systems, okay? So what I want you to learn here is, is basically, it's is not how to do the actual configuration, but it's how the syntax that you need to know to obtain the information that you're going to be looking for, okay? So if you're not, uh, if you're not familiar with networking terminology, like I say, that's fine. This is something that you may want to consider, you know, for for the future after this class. You know, if you want to learn more about about networking, uh, but when it comes to how to understand the network topography that you have in your organization, there are different commands that you need to be familiar with, like IP config, like pin, like ARP, and 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 these commands uh, basically are going to provide you basic uh, information about the communications that you have in your infrastructure, okay? So have any in the class have used the command ipconfig or knows what is the command ipconfig by any chance? Juan, you said that you know. So Juan, when do you use that command ipconfig? For me, uh, I'm not sure what to do. I, 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 okay, so, the main reason I used it was just like, I'm not sure if it was like, man, like I don't really remember, I'm not an expert in this, but um, I do remember like kind of going around and seeing kind of like all the different like IPs that, okay. or no, not the IPs, but the actual um, kind of like, I guess like network infrastructure of my computer, like seeing all like, like, I don't know how to explain it. It's like, it's really hard to explain. I don't know the terminology very well. Okay, so let me let me try to help you here. Let me try to help you. So, so for example, let me, can you still see my screen? Yes, yes or no? Yes. So when uh, on my computer, I'm going to open the command prompt. Can you see my command prompt? Yes. Yeah, yeah, so you can see my command prompt. So let me just maximize this. So here, so you can see Microsoft Windows version 10, Microsoft Corporation, all right reserve. And you can see the drive C, Windows system 32. So in the command prompt, if you can see, it's not, it's not uh, you don't have a lot of graphics. It's all commands, OK? So this GUI, is, when I use the word GUI, it's a graphic user interface. You, you're not going to see graphics, you're not going to see windows, it's going to be all text, okay? Just to give you an idea, so if I use the command CD, period, period, what, I'm, what I just did, I just moved to the root of the Windows operating system within my computer. If I do CD again, now I'm on my drive C. Basically, if I want to see what I have on my uh, hard disk drive, right now I'm talking directly to the hard drive that I have connected on my computer. If I want to see, okay, what is in the hard drive? What, what Josue Cuevas have in this hard drive installed? So what I will do, I will do uh, DIR, oh, DIR oh. okay? If I do DIR, look what happened. Oh. So I will be able to see all the different directories that I have on my computer. If I want to see, so I have- Wait, so is that kind of like LS on Linux? Yes, similar. 
is similar, but this is in Windows. Okay. Yeah, I have to use it too. Yep. So if I want to get access to my Windows uh, directory, so if you can see here how many directories I have, I have the apps, the Dells, the drivers, HP Universal, Print Driver, Intel, Panapto Recorder, Per Logs, Program Files, Program Files, Temp Users, Windows. So I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, twelve drive. Okay, let me see what I what I have on my users. So I will say CD space users and I press enter. Now I'm in that folder. If I want to see what I have in that folder, I will ask again DIR, enter. So inside of that folder, so I can see that these technicians, basically these individuals were able to access my folder, okay? Just to give you an idea, that's basically you know, what, what happens there. If I want to see basically a uh, technician, so I will say CD technician. I will press enter, oh, sorry, access deny. So I don't have access to that directory, okay? So basically that's how the users, you know, will, will, uh, the user's rights will work. So if I want to get out of users, CD space, enter. If I want to go to Windows, CD space, Windows. And now I'm in Windows. If I want to clear this Windows CLS to clear, and you see how I clear the screen? So this is basically just some of the basic commands. You don't need to know them. I know them because I've been working with command prompt for many years, so I, that I'm, I'm, I'm familiar. Uh, with this, if I want to see, let's say, uh, IP config, look what happened here. You see, now I'm getting information. So I can see basically the, uh, the information that I'm connected. I can see the IP address version six, the IP address version four that I'm using, the subnet that I, that I am, and the default gateway. So if you can see with IP config, I just can see uh, some of the basic information. So when someone asks me, Josue, what is the IP address of your computer that you have right now? So I just do IP config and I can show them the IP address. Okay. So if I want to clean it, CLS, and I will, and I will clean it again. So let me go back to, to my presentation. So basically when, uh, let me do the switch here. So when you're using those commands, so uh, Juan, just want to give you an idea, basically, you know, how, what, how that command will work, okay? So when you're using these commands, basically you want to, see what is the footprint that you have in your network system. And when you see the footprint using these commands, this is how you can identify if you have a rugged system detection. So when you have a rugged system detection, that means that you have an, an unauthorized individual or an unauthorized uh, service or unauthorized uh, application that is being running in your system. So going back to Lamar's comments at, uh, earlier that Lamar was asking how you, how you can identify, you know, if you have someone that is, not, that is not authorized. Well, here you have one step. So you do an IP config or you can check the directory and you can see if there's any services that are running or, or they're not running, okay? Okay, ping, when you use the ping command, basically this is when you want to test the connectivity of a host. All right, now let's say that, that you're in your office and someone call you, hey, I think that this system is down, okay? Uh, and I don't know if, if our system are being compromised or hacked. So if you want to do the, the easiest way just to, to check if a system is down, you do a ping. Okay, but in order to do a ping, anyone know what you're going to need? An IP address or what's An it? IP address. Yeah, you're going to need an IP address. So what you're going to do, you're going to go to the command prompt if you're in Windows, and you're going to type PING ping space and then the IP address that belongs to that system that someone believes that is down. 
And if you get the results, like the one that you have in this uh, window right here, so it's going to tell you that there is communication. So if there's communication, you will tell your coworker, I see communication, I don't see nothing wrong with this. So probably something at your end, okay? So just keep that in mind that there are going to be times that you're going to receive phone calls. Well, hey, I think that our servers you know, are down or being compromised. First thing that you want to do, let's check the connectivity. Let's, let's double check that everything is working fine with, with, with the system, okay? Thank so you. The ping, huh? um, with the ping, it, it tests the network, right? With the ping, it will, it will tell you if you have connectivity. If, you, if your computer can connect to that system, if you can establish communication. If for some reason you cannot establish communication, uh, it, it, it will tell you that basically that no connectivity happened, that it fails. And that's when you will know, okay, I cannot communicate. Now you know, okay, there is no communication. Did that answer your question? Yes, please. Thank you. Yeah, yes. Okay. Good, good. Okay. Uh, ARP basically is the address resolution protocol. Uh, this one is going to help you to identify uh, the different uh, subnets, gateways that you have. It's, it's going to show you know, the media access control, the MAC address, and also it's going to validate that the MAC address are, are valid. So why it is important to identify and to recognize MAC addresses? Why do you think that this is important? For your network, you mean? Uh-huh. Because uh, the MAC the address is, um, is burned into the NIC card. So you know that that, well, you could identify that MAC address is supposed to be on your network, I guess. Right. You could do that. You could do MAC filtering and find out if it's on there, or you could uh, do port security and keep the MAC, keep and whitelist all the ones you want. Yes. Can, can you have Lamar? Can you have a, can, could it be possible that, that there's going to be a device that will have two MAC addresses? It's not supposed to have a MAC or two. Well, you could have it if you have, uh, it depends if you want to, like, you, you can do it with a router. You're having two MAC addresses, one coming for incoming traffic, one for outgoing traffic. But they're separate. They're two, yeah. yes. They're, they're two, two different, yeah, they're two yeah. different uh, 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 devices. Yes, so let me just share something, you know, with the class. When you hear the terminology MAC addresses, when manufacturers are developing devices like cell phones, tablets, computers, uh, alarms, uh, a, a internet of things, they will have a unique identifier that it cannot be used in anything else following federal regulations. And uh, the federal government in the United States, is, is they monitor that. Any company, any company that wants to conduct business with the United States, they need to follow these guidelines. And so that's why laptops, you know, laptops can have different IP addresses. You have dynamic IP addresses that will change, but they have one MAC address. And the MAC address is integrated in the NIC card. So that's something, it's like a social security. It's, it's, it's me asking you the question, can someone in the United States can have your same social security? Technically. Technically, no, right? Technically, no. Un unless there is an identity theft. And now someone, per uh, someone else is trying to be you. But technically, no one can have another person's social security number. So I want you to compare the MAC address with your social security. And the MAC address is like the unique identifier for devices like laptops, cell phones, uh, monitors, TVs, uh, the internet of things. With the MAC address, this is how you can identify, okay, if we want to get an investigation and now we're going to involve the FBI, one of the questions that the FBI is going to ask is, do you have the MAC address? Because with the MAC address, the FBI, they're going to look in their databases. Okay, let's find out who's the manufacturer. Okay, this manufacturer is based in China, as an example. 
Okay, let's contact the manufacturer. Manufacturer, we have this MAC address. Where this MAC address uh, was sent to it? Okay, that MAC address was sent to Texas. All right, now we have a state that the MAC address, basically the shipment, it was originally sent to Texas. To who? Okay, this was uh, sold to uh, Best Buy in Texas. Okay, so now we have a location. Best Buy of Texas, we're looking for this MAC address. By any chance, do you have uh, who purchased you know, this, this device? And now they're going to say, okay, uh, all the devices that were purchased from the manufacturer, this is the list of all the consumers that purchased them, following their credit card information. You see what I'm saying? Following their credit card information, this is all the individuals that we sold something that is related to that vendor that, that have that possible MAC address. But what happened is someone paying cash? Right there is going to be a challenge now to try to track, okay? But then they can, uh, they can uh, show, okay, and these were all the, the customers that we don't know, but they pay in cash. Do we have an email account for those customers that pay in cash on record? Okay, so here's all the email accounts, but there's some customers that do not have email accounts. So if you can see, just with asking the question about the MAC address, you can start putting pieces together. You follow me so far? Okay. All right. So this is this is why you know uh, it, it is important for you to start understanding why these commands are are important and you need to be familiar with. Okay. Give me a second here. All right. So what I want to share with the class. Give me one second here. So let me find this. And this is something, let me put it in the, let me put it in the chat. Okay, and, and let me share my screen because I want you to see what I'm looking at. Can you see my screen now? That is a Windows command? Yes. yes. Okay, so yeah. in, the, in the chat, what I'm going to do, I'm going to share uh, this article. All right, I want you to copy that document. And this document is coming from docs.microsoft.com, uh, English US Windows Server Administration, Windows Commands, Windows Commands. So what I want you to be familiar with, so here you have different commands that you have for different applications like Windows 8.1, Windows 10, Windows Server 2008, Windows Server 2012, Windows Server 2016, Windows Server 2019. When you scroll down, so here you have different command lines, okay? So when I was showing you about the IP config, so I, I'm going to click on I, and then on I, I have IP config, okay? And IP config, if I click there, so here you have the explanation from the manufacturer. So IP config, displays all current TCP IP network configuration values and refresh the dynamic host configuration protocol, DHCP, and domain name systems settings. Use without parameters. IP config displays internet protocol version four and internet protocol version six addresses, subnet mask and default gateway for all adapters. And here, so you have basically the syntax. And as a cybersecurity practitioner, this, this is what you need to be familiar with. It's with the syntax, okay? And, and like, I, like I'm explaining to you, you don't need to memorize all, all, all the six syntax. You know, there are times I, I still need to go back and say, okay, I need to do this. Let, let me go back to the, manu, to the manufacturer, to Windows and see how I can, I can run this command. But if you can see, just with IP, with the IP config, this is all the different parameters that you have available. So IP config space forward slash all, this is what is going to happen. IP config space displays DNS. This is what is going to happen. IP config space uh, forward slash flush DNS. That's what is going to happen. So you type IP config the space, the forward slash, and the name, and you have a description of what is going to happen. So here you have basically the how you will do it, IP config, IP config all, IP config renew local area network. So if someone tells you, 
okay, ref, uh, ref, refresh or renew your IP address. So if you need to renew your IP address, you're going to do IP config forward, forward slash renew. And that's basically how you're going to renew your IP address of your computer. Okay, so I just want you to, to be familiar, you know, with, with the syntax uh, that, that you have from the operating system windows, okay? So they have, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a dictionary here, basically. You have a dictionary that you can, that you can see. Let's say that I want to look for, let's say under D, I'm looking for, let's see one in particular, DC, DCG uh, Pofix. And here again, you will have the syntax with the, with the X same uh, explanation, okay? So this is how you can communicate with the operating system from the back end is using this syntax. And this is using the operating system uh, windows, okay? Now there so can is I ask a question. Yes. Before you leave this page, just so I'm clear, um, the way I would read that is um, whatever D C G P L fix. Yes. Then I add the slash any of those different sections. Correct. Correct. If Correct. I'm picking target, then I also get to pick domain D C or both. That's correct. That's okay. correct. You want to add, you want to have a space between and then the, okay. the forward the forward slash. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. So so if you can see, so you have this library here from from Microsoft that explain all the different commands that, that you have. Especially, you know, if you want to do file transfers, the FTP. So you have the different commands here. Uh, you name it, you know, there's, there is a, a lot of commands that, that you have available. But now let's say that you're not using Windows. Mm -hmm. Now let's say that you're using a different operating system, okay? Like, what like is Linux. Linux? Okay, let's say like Linux, okay? So Linux, let me, give me one second here. Let's see what I can find. Give me one second here. Let me see if I can find. I'm looking here for Give me one second. I'm looking for the for the Linux one. Okay. So uh, I believe it was Jubal, right, for Linux. And so in, in Linux, if you want to understand the, the commands lines or the function lines, so let me put this on the chat too. And again, you have also this in your, in your ebook, but it is important for you to know where you can find this information. It's a linux.die.net forward slash man. That's, that's the link. So in this section right here, man pages are run group into section, you know, to see the full list of Linux man pages for section, please pick one. So I'm going to click on section one, user commands, introduction. And here, so you have uh, a description of how to use these commands uh, in Linux. And then here you're going to be able to see, okay, when you're in the shell. So if you can see in Windows, we call command prompt. In Linux, it's called the shell. So when you, when you are in the shell, this is how you're going to be using the, the different command lines, okay? And in the practical exercise that you're going to have, you're going to have both operating systems, you're going to have Windows, you're going to have Linux, and you're going to be able to, to practice uh, on them. And here, so you have, again, the different directories uh, that you can use and how the process uh, will work. Now, let me come back here for a second and go to Linux Docs. You can still see my page, right? Yes. So Linux, Linux Docs. Okay. This section right here, 
let me look. I believe that they have Bash Guide for Beginners Advanced How to Collection. The, the, okay, this is chapter four, list how to's the Linux operating system. Let me see if I can go. Previous, 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 previous. Okay, here, chapter chapter one. What are the Linux how to's? And if you want to learn how to use uh, Linux, you, you have basically this section right here that explain how to use the operating system. And you can download Linux and, and, and use it. Linux is free, okay? And so and if you can see about this, this uh, jewel, I want you to be familiar where you can find information, uh, to be familiar where you can find the, the shell uh, commands, okay? I'm not expecting that you're going to be an expert on Linux. That's a completely separate class. <laughs> just, just, I don't want you to start thinking, do I need to learn Linux? You know, from now, you don't have, okay? I just want you to be familiar, you know, with, with the terms, okay? Yes. All right. So let me stop this for a second. Okay. All right, so like I said, I want to be respectful with the breaks, okay? So so it's 7.50. Do you want to take like a five, 10 minute break so you can go to the restroom, drink water, and then we will continue? So you will, what are you showing me, your nails? <laughs> okay. saying 10 minutes. 10 minutes, all right. So <laughs> let, let's, let's take 10 minutes of break, all right? So we'll come back at eight o'clock.
Okay, we're getting back. Can everyone hear me? Okay, so let me share my screen. Let me get to my presentation. Yeah, these are, uh, there are other commands that, that we can use, you know, to identify what is a particular route or to trace a route. Uh, for example, route or, or tracer or tracer route. So basically this will show you uh, what is the, the routing of the network connectivity. And also it's going to help you to identify what are the, default route and also the local subnets and also check for suspicious entries. So why this is important? So when when you're working with your network uh, configuration, you want to double check that the data is being transferred from point A to point B in a safe way, okay? And part of your security assessment, you want to double check if you have what is called man in the middle. A man in the middle is basically when your systems are being compromised that someone can capture that data, modify the data and resend the data on your behalf. And that's very dangerous. So that's why all the systems, you know, they need to, to have a solid network infrastructure with the best practices because you want to avoid that someone basically edit your data at the moment that you're being transferring the data. Can you imagine that a bank is doing a wire transfer and someone captured that wire and change, let's say, uh, the number and add zeros or remove zeros in the transaction, it's going to be basically, we have a cost impact uh, on the bank. So that's why you're going to have uh, mechanisms in place that are going to be monitoring how your data is going from point A and from point B and it's going to be encrypted. And when I use the word encrypted, I just want you to understand that you need to have also solid encryptions in place. Because if you do not have solid encryptions in place, someone can decode your encryption and then modify the data. So not because it's encrypted means that it's secure. Also the encryption that you're using needs to, to follow some parameters that you need to have in place. And this is something you know that we're going to practice uh, I'm, I'm using different terminologies here. So for you to, to start getting familiar. So in, in this case right here, following basically the route uh, of the data so we can see the destination. So basically and the, the gateway that is going and the subnet that needs to go. So this is helping uh, to monitor how the data has been uh, transmit from point A through point B and also the, the networks that you have established that trust relationship. And this is something that between networks, if you're going to transfer data, you need to establish that trust relationship. So you're going to be working with other network engineers and say, okay, we're going to open this port and via this port, this is how we're going to establish our trust relationship. And these are the parameters and the rules that we're going to have in place and the authentication systems that we're going to follow. So, so if you can see that when you're doing a cybersecurity, uh, a security assessment, you're looking also, you know, how's the configuration that you have with your communication channels. Okay. Okay. Uh, IP scanners and, and NAP and, and something that, that I want you again, for you to, to understand, you don't need to know everything from NNAP. Uh, and I'm going to cover in detail about NNAP basically will provide you the information when you have your network switches. And, and again, this is for, for your information for you to be familiar with. 
so that you can start understanding the, the terminology that, that we're going to be using. Okay, so host discovery, basically you're going to test whatever the host and an IPA address, you know, range respond to, to probes. And port scan, you're going to test whatever the TCP or UDP ports allows connection. All right, let's, let's just put some uh, attention here to port scans. When we're talking about here, uh, port scans and, and the communication that we're going to use to enable or disable data transmissions via ports, we're talking here about numbers that you as a human, you're not going to see or basically or touch. It's a configuration. So if you look on, on this diagram here, so the application NAP is, is doing basically a, a scanning of this IP address. And you need to have this application installed in, in order to use it. And it's going to identify basically all the ports that, that you have. And if you can see port 53, port 80, port 88, port 135, port 139, port 389, and so on. And then you're going to see uh, what are the services that you're getting to those ports. Like for example, port 443, if this port is disabled, basically you're not going to be able to show any hypertext transfer protocol secure. So basically credit card transactions would not work if port 440, 4483 is, is disabled. Everything that needs to be secure in your network infrastructure will fail. So that's the port that is being defined for secure transactions, okay? Uh, so here you have an idea about this application. So let me just make a quick pause and, and, and share with the class when it, when it comes to, to these ports. So it's uh, nmap.org. One second here, let me share. Okay, so now this tool, Again, you have this in your in your ebook. Uh, can you see my screen? Just want to double check. Can you see it? Yes. So here, let me put it in the chat for everybody. So it's uh, nmap.org. So this is this is a tool that I want you to bookmark, and it's a tool that eventually you're going to download it in your professional career. You're, we're going to be using this in your practice labs, but I just want you to start getting familiar. If you need to do a scanning of the open ports and disabled ports that you have in your, in your network infrastructure, so you're going to hear that your network team are going to be talking about, okay, so probably we can run an Nmap. So when they, they use the terminology Nmap, so now you're going to associate this tool. Okay, this is how we can do a scanning of all the ports that we have in our network infrastructure that are open and closed. So why this is important. So if you have ports that are supposed to be closed and they're open, this is a, it's a risk you know, for your organization. So when you run this scanning, you're going to receive a full report. Okay, this is everything that is opening and this is everything that is closed. So you want to double check, okay, all the ports that you have open and you need to ask one question. And this is an exercise that, that I normally do. And this is an exercise that you as a cybersecurity practitioner will conduct. One question that you need to ask when you see that report that, that shows you all the open ports. So you're going to sit down with your network team and you had the report in front of you and, and everyone had the same report and you're going to go one by one. Okay, why this port is open? You see the question that I asked, why? Why this port is open? And you're going to ask the same question for all the ports. And probably you're going to have more than a thousand ports open. Okay, so make sure you're patient. It's an exercise. And, and when you ask the question, why this port? Uh, why this port needs to be open? Then you're going to start documenting. Okay, port number four forty three needs to be open for these activities. Okay, and then you will go to the next port. Okay, why this port needs to be open? 
and then the network team is going to be explaining this port needs to be open for these reasons. Okay, and in that in that exercise, then you're going to get to some ports that you're going to say, you know what, we don't use that port. We don't know why that port is open. Then if someone in, in the network team don't know why the network port is open, it's supposed to be closed, then we need to ask the question, what is the risk if we close that port? If we don't know if someone is using it? Well, uh, no one is supposed to be using that port. Uh, let's just flag this port and conduct folder analysis before we, we disable it. Now the network team, they're going to conduct their folder analysis to see if there's any application software that requires that port to be open. Because this is what is going to happen when you disable the port. If an application software have a dependency that that port needs to be open and you close it, then you're going to have an application program that is going to have communication issues. Just keep that in mind. You don't want just to close it because no one knows why it's open. No, you, you want to give time so that they can conduct folder analysis and find out if there is a dependency. In some cases, they will say, yes, this is for a legacy system that we have and that port needs to be open in order for us to communicate with that. Okay, fine, let's document it. So going through that exercise, you're going to be building your baseline report for your infrastructure. And now you're going to see, you're, this is part of your X-ray. You're doing an assessment. You're checking all the ports that are open and that are closed. So once you go through all the ports that are open and you ask the question why this port is open, then you're going to look the ports that are closed. And you're going to ask the same question. Why this port is closed? And you're going to basically document it. This port is closed because there is no need for our uh, infrastructure. And, and you're going to continue looking and looking and looking. And there's going to be a possible case that you're going to see a port that is closed. And now someone will say, I think that we should have that port open for better data trans transition. And that will help with the data flow. You see, doing that exercise of the port scanning is going to help you now to understand what needs to be open and what needs to be closed. And once you do that report, you're going to save that report. You're going to print it out, have it on a thumb drive. You're going to isolate it. In the case that your system in the future get compromised, now you have an assessment that you did. So if your system get compromised, you're going to do another port scanning and you're going to see the anyone close or open on the port. So we already know what ports needs to be open and what ports needs to be closed. Let's just do a comparison with the new scanning. Are you following me why this is important? So once you're going to do it, basically to do an, a security assessment, and, and that's, it's going to take time. So please be patient because it's going to take you a few days, a few hours, sometimes you know a, a few weeks or a few months to go through that exercise and to document it. But one is done when your systems, if, if, if one of your system is compromised, you already have a baseline report that you can compare when your systems are compromised. Now you can run the report again and see, okay, do we have any ports that are open that they were supposed to be closed? And right there, you can see if there is a fingerprint. Is someone open something that was supposed to be closed? If you find out that, that a port is open, now you have a starting point. Okay, why that port is open? Then the next question is how that port got to open it. You follow me? Does this make sense? Okay. So with MMAP, so this is an organization. So if you can see, uh, let me minimize this. So, so here you have basically the introduction, you know, MMAP stands for Network Mapper. It's a free and open source. So basically you can download it and it can be used at any company. So it's an open source utility for network discovery and security auditing. Many students and network administrators also find it useful for tasks such as a network inventory, managing services upgrade schedules, and monitoring host or services uptime. This report also is going to tell you all the services that are 
working in your network infrastructure. So now just imagine you go through that exercise and also you identify all the services that you have that are authorized in your company. And now let's say that your systems get compromised and you compare the new scan with the baseline report and you see, okay, I, these are new services that are not authorized. Right there, now you have uh, a possible action, a decision that you need to take. Do we want to uh, stop these services to see if this is stop the, the attack? So if you can see this, this tool is going to provide you good information for you to conduct uh, an assessment of your network infrastructure, okay? So N Nmap uses raw IP packets in novel ways to determine what hosts are available on the network, what services, application name, and versions. Those hosts are offering what operating systems and versions they're running. What a powerful tool here. Now you can see all the operating systems that you have in your network infrastructure using this tool. So what happens if you see an application, uh, a host here that is running Windows 95? What you're going to do? If you find in the report that you have a computer that is running Windows 95. I would figure out why we're using such an outdated system in the network and figure if we could just update it or eliminate it altogether. First question that will ask who has this? Right. <laughs> who, who's using this? I, I need to find out. And, and when you're doing a network inventory and a network assessment, Something that I have found in my career is that the network team do not label the, the data jacks. Okay, so just imagine your office or 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 your room in in your school. A data jack is basically where you can physically connect a computer. Okay, that data jack, if it's not labeled. Physically, it's going to be a challenge for someone to track it. Okay, so one of the exercises that I would strongly recommend to do is to label your data jacks with your switches. Okay, so let me let me give you an example. I think you know if, if you visualize this. Uh, can you still see my screen? Can you see my Google? Okay. Okay. Uh, can you see this? Now just imagine that you need to find a computer in this network closet, in this, in, let me see. Uh, open a new tab, give me one second. Okay, look at this. Let's say, let's say that, that you have someone that is conducting an attack in your organization and, and someone call you, oh, this is coming from this switch with this uh, data port. You're, you're going to find it, don't get me wrong. You're going to find it, it's going to take you a few months, but you're going to find it. So that's why, that's why it is important to have your network closets color coded and clean and label. Right here, I, I'm being in this situation in my career, okay? And it's not fun, it's not fun. So you need to organize and, and normally uh, when you have, you don't have just one of these closets, just to give you an idea in one building, let's say that the building has 10 floors, each floor is going to have a rack to provide the connectivity to, to the network, okay? So when someone tells you that you're connected to the wireless, there's always a wire. So don't don't have the please don't have the mis the, the misperception that because it's wireless there is no wire no when you have the access point that little box that is somewhere in the in the ceiling there is a wire connected to that box that goes to the switch but then it's a physical wire so 
So just keep in mind that when you have, now this is how you want to see your network closets. You want to see them organized and if you can see their label. And this label that you have right here is the same label that needs to be on the wall that you have in your room. And, and, and that's going to be easiest if someone is conducting an attack or someone is doing malicious activities that you can say, okay, port number, uh, okay, it, it's basically port number, uh, net, net, network port number 23. Oh, that's in room 119 on the third floor of this building. Boom, let's go to that building, let's go to that room. That's the importance of having this organized. And look at this one, it's color coded. Is, is, uh, is blue and is green. The reason why you want to use color coder, uh, you can, there are different categories. You can identify what are your servers versus your application servers. So that's one way to color code it. Everything that is blue is connected to a server. Everything that is green is connected to an application server. Or other cases color coder, everything that is blue is first floor, everything that is green is second floor, everything that is red is third floor and so on. Okay. Again, I'm not surprised. I can show you pictures and, and, and this is real. So part of your network assessment is to visit the network closet and you want to tell them, okay, I want to, I want to do a walkthrough. I want to see your network closets. And that's when you're going to see their face and their eyes that they will go. Oh my God, they want to see our network closets. Because normally network closets, uh, people use them as a storage. So you go to the network closet and you're going to see that the custodial, you know, have their broom, their mop, all their chemicals. And no, 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 it's a network closet. And that's when you need to start setting rules uh, for, for that. So come back here to my, to my presentation. So, so just just be aware of be aware uh, of that, and and actually, so I already share with you where's the. Let me see. Come back here. Give me one second, and let me. Where's my end map? Right here. Okay, and and that's why. You know, using this tool, so it is a good thing to know that using the end map, you know, what ports are open, what ports are closed. But you want to do a visit. You want to physically go to the network closets and, and, and see what they have there. Okay. Questions, comments, any questions, any comments so far? Did this make sense, you know, about this tool, end map? Daryl, I see your face. What are you thinking, Daryl? Yeah, I was thinking, would you charge a company extra to clean up their, you know, the Cat5 cables and all that, or Cat6, whatever that is? In, in my case, uh, we did it in Waukegan, and yes, we actually hired a company. Oh, to, you did? Yeah, we did. And actually, that was covered, thanks God, it was covered with the federal government grants, with oh. E-rate. So... And it took us to clean. So we have 26 buildings and we have around 72 network closets. Jesus. All looking like spaghetti. Yes. Uh, oh my God. So, so it took us, I would say like a year with a, with a, with a vendor uh, because it's, it's, not only, it's not only to clean it is to do an inventory. And once you do the inventory, you need to create a VCO diagram right. that shows you everything so that you can then keep that inventory up to date. We created new policies that we say only the ITS department is authorized to enter to this room. Mm -hmm. No custodials can use that for storage. Uh, this is not you know, a break room. Right. We're individuals that will go there and by accident, they will disconnect mm -hmm. a network connection. And then people were calling, hey, this is not working. And we just find out that someone basically was just in the network closet. So what we did, we installed uh, ID locks so that only the ITS department is authorized to go to those closets and no one else can enter. 
and, and we created policies of that. And actually doing that, it helped us with uh, individuals that by accident they were unplugging net, mm -hmm. network cables. So okay. that, mean, that minimized phone calls, that minimized uh, upset uh, users, teachers that were using applications, hey, I'm doing a class, I planned for this for two weeks and now I cannot use it. So it basically is, is helping you to avoid you know, those situations. So I, again, I don't want you to know everything from NAP from A through Z. I just want you to be familiar that, and you're gonna be using this tool, that you have this tool uh, basically to do network inventory, to do port scanning, and also so you can see what versions of application software you're running, what versions of the operating system you're running. So please map this, uh, this uh, link that I share with you. And when you, and when you get uh, some time, just uh, go over in details if you want to learn more about, about this free tool. They have other tools as well. So if you can see under security tools, they have password audits. They have sniffers, and we're going to discuss this in, in this class. They have room scanners, web scanners, wireless, exploitation, uh, packet crafter, and, and more. Click on more, so you're going to see that they have. We're going to talk about Wireshark, Metasploit, Nexus, Aircracks, Nor. So this is all king and a bell. So this is tools that you will need as a cybersecurity practitioner. But please be aware, these are the tools that hackers use. So you're going to be using the same tools. Okay, so in one area, this is what hackers will use to verify your networks and to do poor scanning. On the other side, is at the same tools that you're going to be using to protect your network. Questions, comments? No, okay. Let me... So what yeah, I do have a question. Yes. <clears throat> so my here's what I understand. The, the horrible security, I mean the horrible network closet. You want people to mark their um, ports in the rooms or under the desk or wherever they are, so that you will know which computer goes to which one of those ports. Correct. But you also, where I think I'm confused is when you're mapping the MMAP, those are software things like the HTTPS is a software thing, not a hardware thing. So I don't, I mean, and maybe I'm seeing that wrong, but I don't really see how those things kind of go together. When you so say, when you're looking at all of the ports that are uh, that are open. No, good, 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 good question. Remember what I said at the beginning that there are ports that physically you would not see them, you would not touch them. Remember that. So keep keep that keep that in mind. With the with the M map, you're going to be able to scan in your network infrastructure all the ports that are open and closed. Now just imagine that you have I don't know, thirty buildings. It's going to be impossible to go room by room, floor by floor, and, and basically see who's using what. So that's why you want to do a poor scanning. And, and normally in these 30 buildings, let's say some buildings will have three floors, all the buildings are going to be just one single floor, all the buildings are going to be 20 floors. Each floor is going to have a network closet. Okay? So, for you to see, you have a switch. If the data port that is in that switch, probably there's a wire, and now that wire is go somewhere that you don't know. That's what you want to avoid. You want to have a full understanding. Every single wire that is connected to your network closet, what is the purpose of that wire? Okay, so that's one, that's one piece. So that's basically you doing a physical inspection. Now, 
the end map is basically is to look all the communication ports that you have. Now let's say that you're going to stop that you're going that your company is going to process credit card payments. Okay. So your firewall needs to allow that another company, a bank, can receive and send data packages secure between one company to your company. That connection, you don't see that physically. You don't see it. That's when you run the M map. Okay. Now, when you run the M map, it's also to see all the services that are running in all the computers and in all the devices in your network infrastructure. Okay. Also, you're going to be using M map to identify all the operating systems that are running in your network infrastructure. Okay, the reason what I mentioned that you want to have uh, that inventory is a supplement. Okay, now that now that I did the scanning, that I know what I have. Physically, I need to see that it's also organized. Okay, did that make sense? Did I answer yeah. your question? Yeah, thank you. Okay, good, good. All right, so it is eight thirty-two p.m. And I just want to make sure that I allocate time to see, you know, how we can troubleshoot the issues with the access keys. Okay. So Daryl, you mentioned that you have access to everything, correct? Yes. Okay. Can you share your screen with the class and show what you did and how you can see the information? Okay. Uh, give me a moment to log everything in because okay. my desktop. Yeah. That's fine. That's fine. And Jericho, uh, I will ask you, I, I believe that you also have access, Jericho, right, to everything now? Yes, I do. I do. Okay. okay. Can you share, you know, with the class, you know, what you did and how you did it? Because I just want to make sure, I, I know that you were talking with the technical support. If we can save time, you know, on, on how we can do uh, this troubleshooting, that would be very helpful. Um. Should I uh, share it to you. the class? Yeah, you can share it to the class. Yes. Okay. What I um uh, what I did, I went to the I emailed them um, the CompTIA uh, and with with the screenshot on it uh, that uh, the code is invalid. And then after in, the, in less than twenty four hours, they respond to me and they gave me a new code. And then after that, I have to log into my account and that's it. Okay. So they give you a new quote. A new, new code. Quote. Yep. A, a brand new one. A brand new one. Okay. Yep. All right. Uh, let me go back to Daryl. Daryl, are you ready? Um, not yet. My MacBook is kind of slow. That's why I was using my desktop. There you go. To log in. No, that's fine. That's fine. Okay, so let's just let me just share my screen. Actually, let me make sure that I can see mine. Okay, let me share my screen now very quick. Share screen here. Here. Let me know when you're ready, Daryl. Okay, but during the meantime, I'm sharing my screen. So this is this is what I did on mine. Let me come here. So what I'm going to do, let me open a new browser. So what I did, I went to learn.comtia.org. Uh, That's the link that I'm using, learn.comtia.org. And when I click there, basically it's already pre-configured. Uh, so I'm able to see here the, my guide, the instructional guide, so I can see the ebook, okay? And then in this menu, I also can see the labs. So just want to double check if you are in learn.comtia.org, I just want to make sure that you click in this down pointing arrow, just to double check that you can see the CERN master labs for security. If you cannot, that's fine, because I understand that there are issues, you know, with the access code. And then here, basically you're gonna be able to access the, 
performance-based questions and the different labs that, that we're going to have for the, for the classes, okay? So I'm using learn.comtia.org. Mine looks different from yours, is that? So which one you're using, Lamar? Um, let me, can I show it to you? So I don't see anything on this side and I don't see a drop down. Where is the, the drop down would be? Yeah, I can I can see I can see that you can see the ebook. You can see the video. Click on practice. Click on practice. And those ones, yeah, those ones basically are, but you don't have you don't have the labs. And that learn uh, whatever that is. Yeah, no, I can, yes, I can see that you don't have that. Now, did you register your your labs access code? Well, it wouldn't let me, uh, there's no place to install it here. And then no, but, when I go okay. to uh, the other web page, it doesn't, I can't do it there either. Okay, so this one, okay, let's go to the other website. This one? Yes, okay, give me one second. So right there, you have the different modules to basically that's to practice. So give me one second, Lamar. I'm checking something on my end, okay? Mm -hmm. One second here. Okay, and during the meantime, I'm doing this. Daryl, I just want to, because you mentioned that you went to the same website and entered the same access key to the same website, right? Well, I was able to log into the lab just now, um, but I have the same issue where it's already logged in and I can't really pull up the access key, um, the uh, page where I enter the access key. Um, but like I mentioned before, I used the same URL as the ebook registration. So I think it's with comptia.org or learn.comptia.org. Um, let me see if I have it saved on my desktop. But I think it was it was the same URL as the ebook login. So it was only the two uh, ebook login and cert master. Uh, so for everyone, the same URL used for the ebook, just type in the uh, lab access key into that same URL page and it should work for you. <laughs> Basically, let me actually let me come here. So this is where I am right now. Let me share my screen just to make sure that everyone can see it. So there I went to learn.comtia.org forward slash access key. That's the same page that I used. Okay, so let me, I want to do a quick test with, with the class and make sure that you have your access keys available. So I just share this link with everyone. Lamar, let's do a quick test with yours, okay? So if you can go okay. to learn.comtia.org access key. Mm -hmm. and uh, it works for me, by the way. I got access to the lab through that. So you got access doing that? Yes, uh, I had to enter the access key in, the, in that, what you're doing right, right. now. So yeah, it worked right. for me, yeah. Okay, so let's do, a, let's do that quick test. You know, if everyone can go to learn.comtia.org or forward slash access. Uh, that didn't work slash. for my access key. Yeah, as I said. Uh, you have to use a, 
did you use a new one that I gave you for the third one? You can't reuse the same one that he gave us for the first oh, okay. one. Okay, then I don't have another one then. So okay. I I, yeah. pro I provided three access key. One was for the ebook. The second one was for the practical uh, questions. And the third one was for the labs. I think there might have been an issue with mine. I only got one then. Uh, yeah, I only got the one that you what? sent over on Saturday to me yeah, to read the chat. Maybe David and I got just one because we were later. And that one's not working. Yeah. Okay. So. Yeah, me... I think Lamar got it here too. Okay. So, Caitlin and David, just be patient for a second. I just want to double check because I, I, I need to double check if I have the other codes, you know, for you. For the rest of the class, if you can go to uh, the link that I just share via the mm -hmm. chat and, and use the access code that is related to the, right here, the labs. I just get that in work. Yeah. It work? It's working. It's working. Okay, Works good. For me. I like what I'm hearing so far. <laughs> okay, so I'm in this. Right okay. Okay, so that's you, Lamar, right? That you're Correct. sharing right now. Okay, click mm -hmm. on the pull down menu. Um. Uh, oh. Okay. Right. Yeah. Click there, and right there, so you can see labs, and you have a student guide. Perfect. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, so it's working for you, Daytrick. It worked for you. Okay, so Daryl is working for you. Why Veda, is this working for you? Yeah, it just worked for me too. On the Perfect. drop down, I'm supposed to see the CERT Master Learn and Labs and then the official student guide, right? Perfect. So you can see the actual labs, right? Let me just make sure. I'll go Double check. The first one has um, something like can you share your, your desktop so I can see sure. what you're, yes. Okay, so this looks like. Yes, okay, I can see that. Yeah, perfect, 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 perfect. Mm -hmm. if, yeah, if you click on labs, if you click on labs, now you will have access to, yeah, beautiful. Yeah, just just click on number one, assisted lab exploring. Just click there. So that's going to and click launch lab. Mm, wait a minute, that thing is in the way. Let me move yeah. it. Yeah. Launch lab. Yep. Yeah. Open a new window. And this is the virtual environment that I was telling everyone that it's a safe uh, developing environment so that it's not touching nothing in your computer okay. so if if we break something there fine it's, it's a developing environment <laughs> okay well it's building it so it's building it, it took yeah. it would take like like three minutes but it's good i'm very happy to see that it's working okay. now okay trinita just want to double check if it's working for you or i don't know if you're in the same case like Caitlin and, uh, and like david that i need to provide you the uh, the accounts yeah, so you only sent me one access code. And the access code that I sent you gave you access to? It was just the ebook. Just the ebook. Okay, good. Uh, so Juan you said that, that, that it works. Patricia, it works for you? Oh, you're muted. Yeah, it works. Yeah, it works. And Jericho, he confirmed that it works for him. So now I just need to work with David, with Caitlin. And with Trinita, just to see, you know, uh, those access key. And just give me one second, you know, from, let me. Can you see my screen now or no? No, okay. I'm just checking something here on my end.
Chad, one second, I'm looking. I'm just looking here on my end to see if I got the code for Caitlin and for David and for Tarita. Just give me one second. Sources. Uh, Caitlin, could you please do me a favor? Can you share with me your screen for a second? Just want to see what you're seeing. What you're um, so I have my laptop. It doesn't work with Zoom. So I don't know if I'd be able to log on. Um, give me a few minutes. I can see if I can get onto it okay, on, my, right. on this. What I'm okay. Watching and, Zoom on thing. No, that's okay. And yeah. David, if you can do that, if you can share with me what you're seeing on, on your end. You're muted, Dave. No, but you need to go to learn.comtia. Yes, that one. Okay, perfect. Continue. Okay, sorry. Okay, let me let me take a quick look at the code again. Just want to double check one second here. David. David, what are the last four digits of your access code? Uh, here, I'll show you. Uh, zero nine, nine eight four four. <clears throat> nine eight four four. Mm -hmm. Okay, let me do this. I'm going to. I just want to double check and let me. I'm sending you a via the chat. Okay. Uh, David. Okay. 
going to stop sharing it? Wait. So via the chat, just double check if that's the same. I'm just basically resend it what I receive. Okay. If you can just copy that one and paste it one more time, I just want to see what happened. Yep, same thing. Same thing. Okay, so it's the actual code. And Caitlin, were you able to? Um, yeah, let me see if it will let me share. Okay. Uh, but, uh... Let's see. Okay. Oh. Let's see. All right. Can you see this? Yes, I can see it. Okay. So that's so this is the the um error message I'm getting on the regular after I registered it and then um So that's my access key okay. that you gave me. And then see if it goes through. No. Yeah. Could you please uh, post that one more time? I just want to see the last four digits. Yeah. Yeah. So, is that, yeah. Yes, yeah, the same one. Yeah, it's the same one. Learn.com the other org. Mm -hmm. And you click continue and it say. Yeah, it says. Hmm. That it expired. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I was able to do it on Saturday just fine. And then I went today and then yeah, it says we could not find this code in our system. So that's this might be if that's for the ebook, then I won't have the ebook one. I don't have the ebook one yet. So okay. So this is this is what I'm going to do from my end because I have I have your access keys. So I'm going to be working with the coordinator tomorrow. So I'm, I'm happy to see that it's only three students left that we need to address this so that the rest of the class you know, can, can start using the lab because we're gonna be doing this on Saturday. I just want to make sure that everyone have the access. So uh, Caitlin, David, and Trinita. So tomorrow I'm gonna to be working with the coordinator just to make sure that we can test those, those codes. But from your end, Please do me a favor. Contact Comtia. You have you have their one eight hundred number, and call them and and troubleshoot with them to see if if they can actually provide you a new code to see if that will help you, because probably that's what the coordinator will 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 tell me to do first to say let's make sure that the students are calling Comtia to troubleshoot because that's what happened with Jericho. So we did it with Jericho, they responded to him and they provided a new quote and that actually resolved you know, his problem. So do that. Uh, do you have the email of how to request the service or you need to, uh, you want me to resend it? I was gonna say, can you resend it? Okay, David, I will resend and, it. And the 1-800 number is where on the syllabus? Or... No, the 1-800 one, the number, let me just, uh, Put it right here. Give me one second. Actually, they have. Um, uh, you have to initiate a, a ticket. Yes. So okay. to to open a ticket, this is this is the link to open the ticket. So let me send it to everyone. Okay. So, and I hope that Caitlin, you're getting. You got the text message via the chat. I got it. I opened a ticket earlier today as soon as I saw the okay, issue. You got so it. I okay. just haven't. Okay, so anything. so David, that's how you open a ticket. Okay. And Trinity, that's how you open a ticket with them. And then the phone number. Uh here you have basically the information that I received from them. Actually okay. their tic uh, their their ticket services is way better than calling them. Yeah. Okay. The response yeah, on the ticketing system better. Okay. And it's okay. documented as well, too. Thank you. Good, good. All right. So, so, but anyway, uh, Caitlin, David, and Trinita, if you can communicate with me tomorrow and let me know, you know, if you're getting feedback, come, come, 
from Comte. I just want to make sure that we get this issue resolved as soon as possible. Okay. Okay. All right. For the rest of the students that you already have the access uh, to to Comtea, so make make sure you start getting familiar, you know, with the portal that you have. Saturday, I'm going to give you time so that you can explore and navigate uh, through the different uh, labs. So this this week, I'm not going to do an article. Okay, I just want to make sure that you put all your attention in the reading. Okay, you, for those students that already have the access, if you can start working on your practical questions, so I want you to start doing that. Okay, so if you already have worked, you know, with any article, hold it for the following week because it's great. We're going to be we're going to be using it. Uh, but I just want to make sure that that you're putting you know the attention of this. I know I know that this created some some challenges for you to get access, and I want to be flexible. Uh, with, with everyone. What about the discussion um, question? Because in there it says that we have to work with a group to answer the discussion. Yes. So, and that's something I'm going to discuss shortly. Just give me. <laughs> yes. So, but with the article, uh, I just want to make sure that you put the attention with, with the readings. Okay. Now, with the discussion question that we're going to be working, I'm going to do that activity on Saturday. Okay, so I'm going to give you a short article that that we're going to discuss and then as a group we're going to be working that on the Saturday class, just to let me give me one second here. So I can share that with you. Give me one second here. So if you have the the time during this week, you know, to start uh, working on these activities, the discussion group that we're going to have on Saturday, there are different tools that I'm going to cover on the Wednesday night class. Uh, so you're really familiar with NNAP. I'm going to be talking about Kali.org. Uh, that's another uh, tool. And let me just share with the class. One second, so you can see this because I, I want to make sure that I have the time to go over and share those tools with the class. So this one, Cali.org. So this is another uh, application software that we're going to be using for penetration testing, and I'm going to be sharing another one. So for that discussion, so we're going to have a group activity on Saturday so that you're going to have the time to elaborate on that. Okay, but I want to spend some time this on Wednesday before, you know, uh, you, you start working with, with those activities. Okay. All right, I know that is uh, A59. Uh, just want to First, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to see that the majority of the students have the issue resolved with, with the portal. So David, Tranita, Caitlin, you already had instructions of what you need to do this tomorrow. Follow up with email just to make sure that, that we address that issue. For the rest of the class, uh, please continue with your readings. Start getting familiar with the portal. Just want to double check if before that I conclude the class, are there any questions or comments? I have a question really quickly. So yes. you mentioned that you had distributed more than one um, access code. Were we supposed to use another one for something else? Yeah, there, there, there were there were uh, three access codes. Now the other two, uh, I'm still waiting for you to receive, basically to get you know those one for you. They okay. were older. I'm still waiting for them. Okay. Okay. Any other questions, any other comments? Yeah, just so to be clear, the discussion that we have to fill out, we aren't filling out until after we have the class on Saturday. Yes, it's gonna be during the Saturday class. I'm going to give you time during, okay. this, during the Saturday class. Because what I'm going to do, I'm going to give you a few articles. It's, it's just a quick reading. And then as a group, you're going to have in that discussion. It's going to yeah, happen during the class. In. It's during the class. Oh, so we aren't going to have to put it in the portal that we would normally have to put it in? Not yet until Saturday. Okay. It's not Thank yet. You. It's during the Saturday class, yes. Okay. Yes, yes, during the Saturday class. 
And also um, the assignment that was due on Friday, I had put it in a group. Um, so do I still have to send it in? Because yeah, I, if, I, if it's yeah. already uploaded, it's good. If it's already uploaded into the section, it's good. Yeah, so just in the thread, that that's OK. Right, right. I did. Right. Okay. Yeah. yeah, I did the thread yeah. too. OK, I was yep. just looking through yep. Brightspace. OK. Um, send it over. It, did you already upload it? No, but I put it in the thread, though. Where do you put it? Yes, I just want to make sure that you on a thread, on the discussion thread. Yes, on the discussion thread. Yes, so basically that's what I mean that you already uploaded in the discussion thread oh. in the right space. Okay. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. All right. So I guess that'll be. It. Thank you. No, good, good. Any other questions, comments? Yeah, I had a quick question for Caitlin. So you said your access key worked on Friday, or I mean Saturday. Oh, Saturday. He gave it to me on Saturday, and I registered it and during class, and it let me see all the stuff, and then I went today to check it and. It said it was expired. You log in with your username and password, and it didn't mm -hmm. come. Yeah, it was weird. I just went today. Um, I thought, you know, I was at work, so I was going to try and look at it. And then I, so maybe it was my work computer, but then I tried the same laptop and it didn't work there either. Right. So that was weird. <laughs> I don't know why. Cool. Yeah, Saturday I could get all the, all the labs and everything. And then today, okay. it's not there. Right. Yeah. <laughs> we'll follow up, you know, with that tomorrow. Yeah. Just to sure. No, that's fine. I have it. Like I said, I have a ticket open. I'll call him tomorrow. Good, good, good. All right. So Wednesday, I'm going to continue with lessons number three, and and hopefully, I'm you know, going to provide you the the information. And then Saturday, I want to spend, you know, a lot of time working with the labs, and and then you know we're going to have the group uh, activities as well. Okay. So again, you know, a great class. Thank you everyone, you know, for listening, for asking questions, for sharing your articles, sharing your thoughts. Uh, it is important, you know, that we collaborate, you know, as a one group, one team. Okay. So with that, you know, I'm going to conclude the class for tonight. So thank you very much. And we'll follow up on Wednesday night. Okay. Thank you, Professor. Thank you. Bye-bye. Right, Thanks. Bye-bye. Hey, Professor, how long does it usually take to um, upload the recording? Uh, normally, it, for tonight, I think it's like a, a few hours. It's take like two hours or three hours, and then the link will be available. Okay. All right. Thank you. You know, so you, you know where to find the link, right? Yes, I do. Yes. Okay. Good. good. Right. Thanks. Thanks. Have a good night. Thanks. You too. Bye-bye.